Hello and welcome to the Hot Seat with Violet Gondam, the program that puts the newsmakers in the spotlight to deal with the tough issues relating to Zimbabwe. So who's in the hot seat this week? Welcome to Hot Seat with Violet Gondam. My guest today is veteran politician and legislator Priscilla Nisihera Mbimushonga, who will give us her views on the state of the opposition and the women's movement in Zimbabwe. Welcome on the program, Priscilla. Thank you, Violet. How are you? I'm good. Let me start by getting your views on the current state of uh, party politics in Zimbabwe. What's your take on what's happening right now? Well, let me start with the ruling party. It's much easier (laughs) to describe. Clearly, I think we are beginning to see some kind of implosion that is taking place in in ZANU-PF. But as usual, it would be naive to assume that that implosion will be as fast as uh, some of us may think it will be. It will take a bit of time. But uh, I think we have not seen these very open divisions play out in ZANU-PF because I think everybody is beginning to see that the end is nigh for the leader. Whatever way that may be, there is no way he can continue to be in that leadership after 2018. So clearly that succession battle is out and is on. And that in itself has weakened ZANU PF in many ways, in ways in which it usually strategizes around things, but also in beginning to create the structures that they use for purposes of intimidation and violence. Many will say that even if the infighting has weakened uh, ZANU-PF, ZANU-PF would not have been weakened to the extent that um, they would lose the elections next year. What can you say about that? Well, that that all depends on, on your second question. It depends on how the opposition is going to respond to the current situation that is in ZANU-PF. Clearly, if the opposition does not uh, strategize, does not change tact, ZANU-PF is likely to win and win more resoundingly. What is the state of the opposition right now? It's not too pleasing. One does not get a sense that we have an opposition that understands that it can't be business as usual. You don't get a sense that we have an opposition that is strategic. You don't get a sense that you have an opposition that understands the agency of what we are facing. We are just about 12 months to an election. What I am getting is disappointing. I'm not getting a sense that there is a preparedness, there is an appreciation that uh, this is the time to do good business. It, it all seems like yeah, everybody thinks that it is okay. We, we can continue to be uh, what we have been in the past 20, 25 years and that um, we should expect different results. You know, what you're saying is what many people know and what the general public has been complaining about, that where's Morgan Shagirai, where's Rosh Mnube, where's Gendai Niti, where's um, Dalengwa, Simba Makoni, Priscilla, and all these other people. What is really happening? Why is it the opposition has just gone underground, especially at a time when um, you're all saying that Zanu PF is, is at its weakest? Well, one thing is happening, a diversion. We are are supposed to be looking at an election and there are specific milestones that people should be looking at. First and foremost, there has been the debate around electoral reforms. We should be getting to a point to which we are saying, should we still have that as an agenda? Election reform, 12 months to an election. Is there a possibility that we will have reforms? If we are not going to have reforms, are we going to participate in this election or are we not going to participate in this election? The answer to that question will then determine what it is that becomes the political agenda. I am not getting that. I'm not getting somebody who is asking that question or who is dealing with the reality and who is being pragmatic to say there are not going to be any, any reforms. If we couldn't have the reforms in the inclusive government when we were sitting together at the same table, when we had the international community interested in Zimbabwe, where we had a regional body that was engaged in one way or the other, and we had Zimbabwe on the agenda of the SADC summit every time there was a SADC summit. 
all those things don't exist anymore. So it is, it is folly, it is nonsensical for anybody to think that there are going to be any reforms. Therefore, if the reality is that we are not going to have electoral reforms, if we are going to participate in this election, what is it that we need to be doing? Then we should be setting up those milestones. We have a situation where the system has now said we are going to have a, a new voter throw. And this is how this voter throw is going to be done. In my opinion, it does not make sense to be sitting around arguing around whether there is BVR or no BVR. Whether this thing has been given to the Chinese or given to Mars. The question is that this is what is likely to be used in this election. If this is what is likely to be used, we have a crisis because we have zero people on the voters' row. We have to start getting people to register on the voters' row. A recent opinion poll by the Mass Public Opinion Institute and um, Afrobarometer shows that the President Robert Mugabe has more than 45% approval rate and that the majority of the people surveyed uh, trust religious leaders and more people still trust um, Mugabe than they trust opposition leaders. What do you make of this? True. And, and the first point is to begin to take those polls seriously. The mistake that some of us did was when we had Afrobarometer, when we had uh, the mass public opinion giving us those stats in 2013, we refused to accept them. I am one of those that could not understand what this was all about. And that refusal basically stopped us from beginning to think through what this would mean. Those figures mean a whole lot of things. Who are the people who are voting, for example? Who are the people who understand or believe that their only survival is in ZANU-PF? If we are talking about most of our people coming from the rural communities, and if we are calling ZANU-PF a rural party, like the Mandi has he has called it. That in itself means that ZANU-PF is likely to win the 2018 election. So what is it that we have to strategically do to turn around that thinking? What is the messaging that as political parties we need to be putting out there to be able to get people to think differently about ourselves? Let me just give you a basic example. Mm. One of the things that I have not heard us in the opposition talking about is the amount of or the kind of successes that we scored during the inclusive government. Just a basic figure, a violet. During the inclusive government, we actually had a GDP growth rate of 9%. 9% in 2009. It was just a few months when we got into government. We actually had a um, opening up of schools, of hospitals. The general person in the street has not had a conversation and a messaging around it because the messaging that we have been pushing around has been about the lack of things that we didn't do, the failures that we had in the inclusive government. Therefore, there is no mindset that says these people may not be, have been able to do the political reforms, but in fact they were able to do an economic turnaround, which ZANU-PF has failed to do right now. So you get a sense that as opposition, again, you don't have a group of people that are able to think beyond just the populist, nonsensical rally messages to strategically thinking about what are the positive messages that can get a person, a young person, a woman walking in those streets to begin to think that, yes, these people may not be angels, but at the stage that they were in power or in control of some sort, these are the things that they managed to do. It's not like uh, Mugabe or Zana PF is stopping the opposition from actually uh, pointing out even all those successes uh, that you mentioned that, um, ex uh, ex that happened because of the opposition. Exactly, Violet. And I think this is where the narrative has to change. This continuous narrative of placing our problems in the hands of ZANU-PF. Either it is ZANU-PF that is rigged, it is ZANU-PF that is violent, it is ZANU-PF that stops us from or, or infiltrates our political parties, it is ZANU-PF is the message that has killed this country. And you ask me why we are in this situation. This is why I was saying diversion. Right now, day in, day out, and I'm getting so sick of it. When opposition leaders meet, what is on the agenda is coalition for leadership. It's not coalition for, for, for strategy. It's not coalition for, for thinking through messages. It's coalition.
coalition for leadership and we are stuck in a rut that everything and anything is talking about who is going to lead this coalition how are we going to divide these seats when we get into a coalition even people that i've never heard of somebody who has never even run for council or local authority in their lives or done anything at a community level is beginning to believe that because they woke up one morning and called themselves the president of a political party. Therefore, they are going to be sitting somewhere where a cake is going to be cut out and they will be given their own three seats or two seats or, or, or one seat or whatever it is. And that is what people have become focused on. You have these figures that are coming from the Afrobarometer that are telling you that things don't look so good. Unlike what we did in 2018, where we told these people off, insulted them and said they had been bought by ZANU eh, and refused to take it seriously, we should be looking at these figures and going through those polls. I've not heard of any political party that is looking at that, those Afrobarometer eh, numbers. So looking at numbers, we keep hearing that it's all about the rural vote. Um, it's actually said that 70% of voters are in the rural areas. How representative is your membership um, given these? You know, I think, I think statistics speak much more. You know, um, because we are working on this women's election convergence thing. I've been spending a lot of time looking at the studies and census and, and figures. That, that have been put around. One of the problems that we have had in the urban area, whilst we have a, some form of freedom and less of intimidation, people that come out to vote mostly in elections who are women, actually interestingly violent, in urban areas don't come out as much. You have 93% men coming out to, to register and vote in urban areas compared to 63% of women. So you actually need to play with those figures so that you can either raise the numbers of your women in urban areas, and here I'm talking about a presidential election. Let's assume you are wanting to hit your over 2 million, because we know that Mugabe won by 2.1 in the 2013 election. So for all intents and purposes, we should be saying we should be hitting 3 million. So if you're going to shift those figures, then you need to say, the voting patterns that are in urban areas, we need to up the number of women who are in urban areas who are not going to register and vote because there are more men that are registering than women. When you then go into the rural areas, you have something like 92% of your women coming out to register and voting compared to 90% of men coming out to register and vote. So you can see the numbers are not too bad in rural communities. So your target is to say, who can we change in those rural communities? Who is likely to be influenced by the issues of patronage, by the issues of seeds, by the issues of maize? Who are the heads of household in communities right now? Are they more men or are they more women? And what are the issues that drive these women to go and vote for Zanupia? We have always known that the levels of intimidation and the levels of violence are higher in, in raw areas. Therefore, the women are the weakest point in terms of pushing them around that. So the question is, what is it that we can do, either as political parties or as women, to begin to address those kind of challenges that we're having in raw communities? Are, are women a, a political constituency in them? Yes, they are a political constituency. But if, if you then define them as a political constituency, you then need to engage with them on the basis of what it is that drives that woman to the polling station. So even the polling itself needs to have some, some gender lens to it for it to be useful for our purposes. If mass public opinion can't do it, then we as political parties should be getting into a situation where we are trying to do some kind of polling so we can understand what it is that is driving people to go and vote or to trust the 45% that are trusting Mugabe. It doesn't help for you to sit there and say, ah, they must be lying. They are not because they've done it in 2013 and it has come out exactly as it, it had been predicted to. But can you give us a, a little more detail about this women's election convergence? Because I saw uh, this past week uh, um, you had a gathering in Blauayo where other leaders uh, from the opposition uh, political parties, the women leaders like uh, Tokuzani Kupe, Lucia Matiwinga, and, and Joyce Mujuru were also present. What exactly is this about and how will it work? Yeah, this is basically a, a grouping of women from, initially we were from nine political parties, 
uh, we have just had two other political parties asking to come and join the Women's Election Convergency. So it, it has just one main objective, short-term objective, getting women onto the voters' register. And we have given ourselves a target of 2 million. And we have said to ourselves, how do we reach the 2 million figure? By getting women from political parties who already are political activists. So we are not looking for novices. We are not looking for somebody who has never been a political person. And we want to come up with 20,000 of those women. And each of that woman is then given the responsibility to mobilize 100 women. If we do that we will have hit our 2 million figure. We are hoping that after we have done that, then the issues around parliamentary constituencies and things like that will come as an after to this process. But initially right now, we have said, look here, guys, boys are focused on something else, and we can't be fighting with them and telling them, stop what you are doing. They are focused on sitting in and dealing with this thing about leadership and about seats, which is okay. Let them do that. But somebody has to be putting their ha- their hands on the on the wheel, so to speak. It, it sounds like an ambitious target, you know, two million, and that's something that would be great if you can achieve that. But um, mobilizing people to register to vote is one thing, but um, to actually get people to then go to the to, 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 to the polling station and vote is another thing. Well, what is the that, strategy that, to that get them out That is the difference with this strategy. You see, Violet, oh. if I say to you. I'm not asking you to just go in the street and pick anybody. If I just go in my phone, I've got something like 250 friends on my phone that I chat with. So what we're asking you is just do woman to woman with the person that you know. So this is the person that you follow up and see that they've gone to register. You follow up and see that they've gone to vote because they have something they have some loyalty. They, they owe you something. I have personally now done my 100. And it's a completely different thing altogether. Because they're able to raise their fears. They're able to say to me, but you know what? We don't trust you. We don't think that you guys can do anything different. We don't believe that we can win this election. After all, you people have been telling us about Zanu PF rigging. So what is the difference now? And I have enough time to speak to them. What we will then do as Work 18 is that we, we are going to be launching a hotline. We are also going to try and find what other support mechanisms we can give. In circumstances that somebody phones and says, I've been violated, I've been beaten up, my house has been burned. So that people have a sense that they have some, some way to go back to. And this is why we are calling the police to our meetings, we are calling ZEC to our meetings, we are calling the gender commissions to our meetings, so that we can establish that relationship and be able to pick up those issues that people raise on the ground. Ultimately, there must be a candidate to vote for. And, and I hear you that you, you need to, first of all, uh, sort out the first phase and then you move on to the rest. But then we hear reports that um, the majority of parliamentarians are just there to warm up the seat and they have not done much in parliament. So how do you even get people excited to go and register and even later on to go and vote when you when they don't even have faith in the in the candidates themselves? They don't have faith in the candidates because the candidates have not gone out to show out who they are. People believe that seats are going to be given to them. If we start saying leadership is going to be associated with what you have brought on the table. People will get off their butts, sorry to use that word, and go out and get people excited. The reason why people are not going out to get excited is they believe that they only have to be sitting around a small room and talking and everything will come onto them. So we are going to start this pressure, you know, within communities where people will start demanding that representation will be based on what you have done in a community, how you have represented communities, and not necessarily because you come in in terms of leadership. But you yourself are a beneficiary of proportional representation in, in Parliament. So what has been the benefit of proportional representation and what legislation has been in, in, introduced uh, or supported by those who have come in through the proportional representation system? It's unfair. It's unfair to only make those expectations for those that have come under proportional representation. I think we should be asking if you are a representative, PR or from a, a constituency, the expectation is the same. What have you delivered at your constituency level? And on that part, ZANU-PF has beaten us again, hands down. Primary elections take place with every 
elected person in Zambia. And I, I am sorry that I'm beginning to hear in opposition people who are anti-primary elections. So the only way to get people to understand that their power rests in, in, the, in the people from their communities is to say you will be chosen by those people because then you will then be forced to speak for those people. Otherwise, it will be okay for me to go and sit in and not necessarily respond to my constituency demands and challenges. And if I had my way, primary elections would happen right from the top, from the presidential candidate right to the person who is going to be representing a council. Are you collaborating with any of these initiatives that are encouraging women participation like her vote and she votes? We are definitely working with she votes. We are going to be um, launching a program. We've already launched it, but we are going to be rolling it out, which we are calling Mother Daughter, where we are trying to make sure that mothers and daughters together do work together in beginning to participate in politics because we have noticed that in some instances daughters are political active, mothers are not, or mothers are political active and their daughters are not. Now, you were one of the negotiators just before the GNU. Uh, can you tell us what reforms were actually agreed to and have actually been implemented and which ones are critical to have those reforms before the elections next year? Well, we, we, did, we did have the constitution and within the constitution are most of the issues that would make part of these reforms. The setting up of independent institutions, for example, and making sure that they can be able to deliver a free and fair election, which, which was all the whole question about how ZEC is going to be formulated and who sits at ZEC, how they engage it, all those kinds of things. The changes within the Electoral Act so that you can align it to the, to the Constitution. But I want to go back to the, to the earlier point that I raised. I am not a believer in that we will see any electoral reform. And I think it's time in our minds and in our messages as opposition political parties, we begin to tell ourselves this is almost going to be 2000, it's going to be like 2008, where we had no reforms, where things were bad, and yet we beat ZANU-PF. Our problem, in my opinion, is not whether we can win even under the circumstances. Our problem is when we do win, how do we make sure that we can take over power? And that is a conversation that would be happening behind the scenes. Do we do a Gambia? What do we do? But winning an election, for me, is not necessarily directly linked to electoral reform. So we need to shift the narrative. There are not going to be any electoral reforms. We are dealing with what is on the ground, and we can win this election, but we have to change the way we do business. You've also said that uh, the opposition should be strategic enough and not concentrate right now on the issue of coalitions. And your reasoning was also that, um, you know, if Zana PF wanted to infiltrate, they would have infiltrated already. So if that's the case, don't you think that it's better to start now, discuss the coalitions, discuss what needs to be done, and move on? Um, you know, the main political parties figure out how they're going to work together and then start campaigning. Let, let, let me make this clear. You can have coalitions now, but coalitions to discuss strategy, huh? not coalitions to discuss leadership. Trust me, and I'm willing to do a community service. If you were to come up with a group, with a person you say a leader or persons that you are putting in constituencies right now and you think you are going to do it, I can assure you, I can bet my bottom dollar, that thing will be so messed up by the time you go to an election. If you think you can organize a coalition by having 20 political parties sitting around the table and you think you can discuss in that kind of setting with parties that are breaking up every other minute, with little parties that are going to be sponsored by the system, and you seriously think that you can discuss coalition building in a room with 20 people, even with four political parties, it's an impossibility. Secondly, when you start dealing with issues of leadership, you will have to deal with the issue of who mediates that process. It's not going to happen. What is important is getting people out to register, beginning to set the message that changes the narrative so that people can trust the opposition. They will not trust the opposition because you now have one leader. Political scientist Dr. Ibo Mandaz, I interviewed him um, a couple of weeks ago, and he said it's point of going into elections when you know that um, it's going to be a flawed election and that uh, the opposition is in disarray, but that the opposition rejected calls for national transitional authority. Why? Because it, it wasn't going to happen. It was a dream. 
if we are unable to push for little small reforms, huh? you think you can overhaul a whole system? How are you going to do it? Are you going to do a coup? How? You know, it, it, for me, it, it, there was no basis to even entertain that suggestion because it's so far-fetched, it, it is not going to happen. And that's why some of us did not even give it any time of day because one just knew that it, it, it was an impossibility. Secondly, I'm not a believer in this argument that without reforms you can't win an election. We have won elections without reforms when things were even worse than they are right now. The question is, when you do win that election, what then happens? How do we vote and how do we protect that vote? That is the question. So this whole debate about, oh, you can't win, or oh, the military is pro ZANU-PF, there is no military that is there. We only have this 94-year-old man who holds so much power in political and in ZANU. That is all we are dealing with. All these other things are conspiracies about nothing. Some of us sat in that government for five years. We could see how the military shakes around Robert Mugabe. So no one can come and tell me that we are in this situation because the military is saying this to Mugabe. Nobody tells anything to Robert Mugabe. He has his own power and his own control. But we can win this election. And for me, that is the message you should be sending to people. Where is Priscilla in 28 elections? Are you going to be running? I have no idea. Like everybody <laughs> else, I have no idea. But my priority right now is to make sure that whether I run or I don't run, I want to make sure that zanu is out of power. So it's little about Priscilla. It's more about my passion. I've had too many years doing this thing. I can't continue to do this for another 20 years or 10 years. That was uh, legislator Priscilla Nsiara Mushonga speaking to us on the program Hot Seat. You've been listening to the program Hot Seat with Violet Gonda.